long before we were even born, they were showing films and talking about travel. And Hal and I got into the business after we had another career. Hal was a newspaper man, and I was a civil engineer. And I built uh, airports and air bases all over the world, including Dulles Airport, Washington, D.C. area. I did the airspace analysis for that one, but we're here to talk about travel logs. And I first became acquainted when I ran the projector for Burton Holmes. Burton Holmes is considered to be the, the father of modern travel logs. He did bring it into the 20th century back in, he started back in 1897. And he was a smash hit at the Camera Club of Chicago and then went on to be uh, a man that uh, everybody looked up to when it came to world travel. And made a fortune. And he did. Uh, he followed in the footsteps of John Stoddard, who started before that in Boston. And they anyway, were showing but, slides, though. Yes, they were all slides until the 1930s, and then he got into 35 millimeter film, and later on, 16 millimeter color, which was, uh, which was a wow. But before that, you can imagine, they had the Grand Panorama. The Grand Panorama was the showboats on the Ohio and the Mississippi River. And what was that? Well, uh, artists would paint scenes of uh, various things. One of them was the Great Whaling Voyage. And you can still see some of that uh, footage, uh, actually a big canvas sheet in the uh, Whaling Museum in Bedford, uh, in New England. Uh, but they painted this, the, the canvas was rolled like a Torah, and the narrator would tell about what was happening. And then another one of those grand panoramas was the burning of Moscow. Very popular, and they had these on showboats on the Ohio and the Mississippi. Well then, they graduated when photography came into being. Uh, into slides, black and white slides. So where did you make your first film? Well, I made my first film when I lived in Italy as an engineer, and uh, Burton Holmes uh, had told me, uh, well, Stan, why don't you make a movie? And I said, well, Mr. Holmes, I will, but first I'm an engineer. Well, anyway, we lived across the street from the Naval Academy in Livorno, Italy, and the people that I worked with said, you should make a film about Tuscany. And I did, the golden province of Tuscany in Italy. And it was first shown at the Civic Auditorium in Pasadena. Oh. And how that happened, uh, I went to, uh, when I returned from Italy, uh, I returned and went to one of the agents in Beverly Hills and she said, well, we'll have Elmer Wilson look at your film. And I did. And I thought I'd be showing it on the wall in his office. But no. <laughs> he said, come on down to the auditorium. He had his projectionist. And he was the only one, 2,500 seats, sitting in the audience. And he said, okay, young fella, do your stuff. So I ad-libbed this uh, travelogue about Tuscany. And when the lights went up, he said, when are you available? Oh, well, that was music to you. Yeah, he liked it. Well, I was still an engineer, transferred from the West Coast to build Dulles Airport. And then uh, they scheduled these programs a year and a half in advance. So I had to uh, fly back to the West Coast from Virginia and put on the show and then fly back home. And of course, the fee that I got took care of the airfare and I had nothing <laughs> to show for the effort except the experience yeah. and that was fun. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I got started in, uh, in travelogues. Well, when, when I first met you, you had, uh, that was in the 1978, uh, you, you, you were a pro then. Well, not, uh, not exactly, although I did show that film when I was living in Virginia. Uh, I did show that film, Tuscany, Italy's Golden Province. I showed it at the Town Hall in New York, uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and uh, the Philadelphia Geographic Society, all the big uh, locations, the big venues. 
uh, that I could get to while still living in Virginia. So I cut my teeth by doing that. Yeah, but that, okay, then you, you resigned or left resigned. engineering yeah. and it went into travel films. Well, yes, uh, I, one of my engineering assignments was down in Bolivia. We were studying the transportation system and I was the airport engineer and I noticed how wonderful and how colorful Bolivia was. And I also knew, keeping in touch with travelogue people, that no one had ever done a film on Bolivia. So there was a reason for it? Uh, well, it's too isolated and uh, the high altitude and so forth. But um, so I decided, well, I'll do a film on Bolivia. And I had my camera with me and did a lot of shooting. And then I retired from engineering and I went back. Three days later, I went back to Bolivia and finished the film. And so living in Bur Bolivia was quite an experience. And that was film. We, we were talking about film all we're, the way here. We're talking about 16 millimeter film. Yeah. And it was heavy when you carry 3,000 to 4,000 feet in 100 foot rolls. Going through airports. Yes, going through airports. Uh, it was funny how I got into Bolivia without going through customs. Be on the plane, I was talking with a young man, Bolivian, and uh, I told him that I was wondering how I would get through. And he said, stick with me. My brother is one of the ministers in the government here, and you can make out like you're in my party. And so we just walked through with, <laughs> with the minister. Anyway, but I don't think I'd have had any trouble anyway. But anyway, it was easy. Going through, I had the pro same problem, going into Jordan with all this footage, and the customs were used to little bakshis here and a little bak, and I wasn't going to pay anything. I had a very, very close budget, and I had eventually I went to the uh, uh, one of the officials in the government and got uh, and got my film on. Otherwise, I'd still be there. <laughs> well, that reminds me of uh, Ray Green, who did the first film on Russia. He went uh, across on the Siberian Railroad and uh, with all this film. And when he got there, the, before he left the country, the Russians confiscated his film. And it was all exposed, of course, and, uh, well, what to do? Well, you know, when he uh, was ready to leave Vladivostok, uh, the Russians returned all his film. They, they on, hadn't on looked at own? it they, on their own. It hadn't been developed, nothing. And so it was one of those things. But there is a lot of uh, funny stories by people, and I'm sure you have a funny story or two. But I remember uh, Bob Friars. Oh, yeah. Bob Friars. A, a good uh, filmmaker. He was showing in Iowa. It was in the winter and the snow was on the ground and the auditorium was hot and uh, the auditorium was full. And uh, so he stepped out the stage door and here were a couple of boys throwing snowballs. So he reached down, got some snow, and when he did that, the door to the stage slammed shut. <laughs> so, well, he threw his snowball and then he went around to the box office and the, the only person that he could find and he said, I've got to get in there. And he says, I'm sorry. The lady in the box office said, I'm sorry, sir, but we're sold out. There's no more seats, but I'm the program. Oh no, he's on stage doing the program right now. And about that time, <laughs> the, the, the manager of the theater saw him out there desperately. And of course he opened the door and Bob came in, ran down the aisle and got up on the stage just in time because he had been out during a musical interlude in his film. But uh, stories like that. Another filmmaker uh, was flying into a small town and, and he set his film. These are 16 millimeter reels of film. Uh, he set it by the door in this small uh, airliner. And unfortunately, they made a stop before getting to his de destination. And they offloaded his film, unbeknownst to him. <laughs> anyway, and when he arrived, of course, here's no film. Well, of course, everybody panicked, but in time, the airline realized what had happened and they returned his film just in time to put on the show. Another one was Kurt Nagel. 
Kurt Nagel was scheduled to do his show on London and uh, he had many subjects and so uh, what happened was that they gave him the wrong film at his office and he flew in and it was uh, on Paris. What to do? So when he got on stage he said, well you know folks, when you're flying very, very often the airliners are, uh, are diverted because of fog and tonight we have fog in London so we're going to go to Paris. And <laughs> the auditorium erupted and they enjoyed his film on Paris. You know the first uh, I made this film on, on Israel, the gates of Jerusalem, and the uh, first time I showed it was in Honolulu. If you remember the uh, footage out there, the man who ran it was never paid you any money, but he flew you out and back and they paid you for your hotel. So the second time I showed the film, uh, it was at a synagogue, and the, they had no auditorium, and you set out, uh, the, the audience was sitting right out in front, and the projector was right among the audience. So this was a nice uh, film for the, for the church, for the synagogue, and they really liked part of it. And then funny, uh, right in the middle, uh, I heard this, uh, I think we better stop the film, and I looked, and the screen was going beautiful, nothing problem, no problem. So uh, nobody stopped it, and uh, I had a projectionist who happened to be in the bathroom at the time. And somebody said, please, we better stop the film. And uh, again, I looked, and they said, help, that did it. I I yelled, we got to stop the film. And uh, he comes from the bathroom, looks, turns on the light. And the film had broke, and the, the wife of the rabbi was sitting right beside it, and it was around her hair <laughs> and down her back. And if she had moved, I would have been finished. I would have been out of the picture right away. But it, it was okay. And it was, made the film, finished the film. Oh, a, a similar episode like that, I had forgotten the take-up reel and what to do with this film going through the camera or the projector. And so, well, the solution is a wastebasket lined with towels and let the film fall into that. So oh, that's very smart, yeah. Do you remember making the switch to digital? Yes, uh, I do, and I remember you were the first one, the pioneer, in switching from film to digital, and you had a projector that was uh, about half the size of a Volkswagen bus. 16,000 bucks. Yes, and, it, and you called it Big Bertha. It was really a big projector. Remember, and Ralph, our, Ralph had, uh, was our, is our uh, uh, agent, and he had T-shirts ready when we went out to Palm Springs to show the picture, first time, and to show digital permission. And if I remember correctly, um, we had a, a gentleman here in the studio right now that uh, made the first uh, first film, or we call him film, but it was not a film, of course, but digital. Showed it to our group who hated the idea of going from film to digital. And uh, our, our friend here managed to sneak it in and from then on everybody eventually came over to digital. And his name was Joe Michalizzi. Oh yeah, Joe, he's a technician par excellence. Oh, he's, he's a man around town too. Uh, yeah, and a producer, yeah. filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good friend of ours. Okay, this is supposed to be about you guys, not me. But Joe, you're here! <laughs> wow! <laughs> Amazing! You remember that, Joe? I do. You know, we started a small riot because it was, we, we were being asked, where's your reel? Because the projectionists wanted to get set up. 
And it was, since it was after lunch, we said, well, we'll give it to you after lunch. Little did they know we snuck Hal's projector in, did the setup. And then afterwards, Jim Tompkins went. So there were two films in a row. And then after that was the riot. <laughs> yeah. Unanimously, they were pretty upset. Yeah. But I'm going to leave you two guys. Okay, well, no, thanks for dropping by. We're there you go. To leave you. Yeah, remember when we were coming back from uh, Vegas the first time, you and Jim and me? Yeah, right. And, and you, you were asking about making films. And I right. said, there's three sort of Western type films. And I said, uh, there was one about the Billy the Kid, and, and there was one about the Oregon Trail. Right. And, the Pony Express, and Jim made the Oregon one, Trail. And you made Billy the Kid, and I made the other one. There you go. I, I got the I, westerns. I really couldn't believe that we ever did that all together. I, I would love the experience. It uh, was a great. I'll experience. let you guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, my memory of Joe is he was shooting a wedding, and he dropped by and took me, and it was a posh wedding. And but it they was even, digital, right? They even had a table set up at the reception for cameramen. And I said, boy, this is really great. He, and Joe looked at me and said, well, they don't do this at every wedding. So, But it was digital, right? It was digital, yeah, yes. Yeah. But I remember when Burton Holmes switched to 16 millimeter film, uh, he was not for it because he liked the 35 black and white. So Thayer Soul made a film uh, on 16 millimeter color, Kodachrome color film and he showed it to Burton Holmes, and Burton Holmes thought it was great, and he said, well, I guess Papa has to learn to do new things. And that's what we did, learning to do new things with digital. And Burton Holmes, uh, when he died, when he, uh, he didn't die right away, but uh, when he retired, uh, who, who took his place? Uh, Thayer Soul. Thayer Soul. Thayer Soul was one of the lecturers on the circuit for Burton Holmes, and then when Burton Holmes passed away, uh, Thayer went independent. Yeah, and he became the star. A very successful star, and he was already a star on the Burton Holmes yeah. series. Uh, but Burton Holmes did it for 50 years, and Thayer told me, I'm going to do it for 60. And he did, and that's, that's when he retired. 60 years on the stage. And showing the homes. That's a quote. Well, credit. Thayer Soul had an interesting career. When he first started out, it was just before World War II, and it broke, and he, uh, uh, he got into the military and actually set up the first film unit for the Marine Corps. Yeah, they didn't have anybody. They had no one, and he was uh, brought in. He never went through boot camp or anything. He was made an officer immediately, and... Washington, he, he was assigned a sergeant who knew the ropes, and uh, so that's, he guided, the sergeant guided him, but uh, Thayer made some movies on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, what do they call them? The, whatever it is, anyway, they practice battle scenes and so forth down at Camp Lejeune, and then they showed these to the, some of the generals. Well, the generals were looking at this movie and they said, they looked at it and said, well, that man doesn't have his rifle. Right? That man still has a safety on his rifle and so forth. And that was the first and only time they decided to show the films to the generals. <laughs> From then on, they just made films. Anyway, he was uh, instrumental in filming uh, Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. A lot of the footage you see was taken by uh, film cameramen that he recruited. So... Well, what about uh, the state of the uh, art today? What do you think? Is it going to make it? Well, we have to change our method of, of uh, showing films, of, of uh, putting them on. I think well, service documentary, I think. Yeah, the documentaries. Uh, the service clubs used to sponsor them, and that's fading out. And now we have to edit our films to be attractive to the multi-screen cinemas. And um, Ralph Franklin, our agent, uh, is doing very well at a cinema in Omaha. He's blazing a trail for putting on our documentary films, Travel Adventure, in the multi-cinema 
uh, multi-screen cinemas. I think we all thought that when the our first generation, the older people, when they passed away or retired or whatever, their kids would come in and take their place. Well, their kids, the young, the next generation, didn't want to have anything to do with we uh, with these films that we were showing. They wanted to do it themselves, and they're still not coming in. Well, I remember though uh, we were uh, showing films around the country, and the local PBS stations would invite us to show clips from our films, yeah. and we did that for a number of years. Very very popular, it was fun to do, yeah. but now they, uh, there are so many, and so many people have cameras, camcorders especially, uh, they make their own travelogues, so we have to edit our films mm -hmm. in a different manner to make them more adventuresome. And we can do it, got to do it with humor. And this is the way they can make it. <laughs> That's right. Well, the quality is so much better now, uh, mm -hmm. and the new version of, of Apple, yeah. I, iPhone uh, and iPad is, is, is excellent, excellent. Of course, we uh, do some other things. I made a film uh, recently on the, the banjo uh, convention up in Sacramento called Banjo Rama, and the world-class ban banjo players appeared, and I have edit videoed them, and I'm editing that into a new film on banjos. Beautiful. You can imagine the classics being played on a banjo. Outstanding players. Yeah. And then I did other films. I did one. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I, when aviation first came on the scene. And I made a film called Dawn Patrol Rendezvous. And it shows World War I planes uh, that uh, they're, they're small and uh, new, of course, uh, showing them at the uh, Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. So I've got that, so I'm showing that around. And I also did a book, you did a book too, but I did a book uh, about um, a flyer that I knew, he was a mentor, and I went to school with his uh, son and daughter in Lakewood, New Jersey. And he was uh, Colonel Schaffler, uh, who uh, flew in World War I, and he, would, he flew and learned to fly with Billy Mitchell. And so a lot, of, uh, a lot of stories in his letters, he wrote beautiful letters from France about what they were doing, not only about flying, but the life in France during World War I. And it's really a, a lovely book if you're really interested in flying, not only flying, but World War I. And your book is in three chapters, three reels, and it's called yes. Adventuring. Uh, you review. Are you going to show? I've, are you going to show that to me or not? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's called Adventuring, and Hal has done it in three parts. One as a uh, flyer in World War II, and also uh, as a newsman for Associated Press, a career in that, and then getting into travel films. Uh, the yeah. adventure. So it's a fascinating book. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. And he even mentions me in it, along with many other yes, travel yes. filmmakers. Well, one the, I have to mention the star for heaven's sake. <laughs> no, well, it was great fun. And uh, uh, writing it too. Yeah, it was a uh, a great life doing that, and still is. As a matter of fact, I'm the first show opening the series at. El Camino College. What are you showing? Huh? And I'm showing uh, Steamboating Alaska uh -oh. uh, on replica Mississippi steamboats. And I'm, that's the first show of the new series in, uh, at uh, El Camino College. And then I go back east. I'll be doing shows at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie and uh, on other venues in the Midwest and the east. So we're still at it. You're still at it. If um, I'm, if our manager gets an opening around here, maybe as far as maybe Arizona, but that, I'm not going back east. Well, ever. 
Well, I hope folks looking at this video will, will join the F F World on Film Club here, uh, showing films once a month at Laguna Woods. Uh, they uh, have us showing our films. I've appeared here several times, and so have you. Uh, by the way, speaking of uh, the Pony Express, I went up to the Sacramento area when you were filming up there. Uh, the start of the Pony Express reenactment. Every year they, they do that, and your video shows it, and it's called uh, the Echo of Hoofbeats. Echo of Hoofbeats, yeah. a marvelous film about the Pony Express. Yeah, that was uh, very interesting because I, I didn't, I had no idea what the Pony Express did. I just knew they carried letters. And they go day and night. They go day and night, and it takes 10 days to cross, the, halfway across the United States on horses. Yeah, it was uh, progress for its time. The Pony Express lasted for about a year and a half. And then they had the first telegraph lines from coast to coast. So. It started during the... Uh, uh, during the Civil War, uh -huh. and some of the riders left to go to the Civil to go to fighting. Yeah. <laughs>and Stan Walsh talking about their amazing life and travels. And we will miss his spirit for adventure. Life in the village moves on, but Hal McClure will be missed for all that he contributed to our community and to the Laguna Woods Video Club.